Hello class, this is Ms. Augustine, and today we're going to start our notes for chapter 10, which is about states of matter. So when we do this, we always begin with an intro about kinetic molecular theory. And kinetic molecular theory, uh, we start with how it applies to gases. Kinetic meaning, as in kinetic energy, the energy that something has because of its motion. So kinetic molecular theory is referring to the fact that all particles of matter are in constant motion, even solids. So this is an illustration of gas particles, and in this case it's atoms. But when we're talking about matter, all matter is in motion in some way. And in the case of solids, it's vibrations. In case of liquids, there's more motion than solids and gases are the most energetic. So again, uh, kinetic theory is referring to the fact that all particles of matter, even solids, are in constant motion. So this kinetic molecular theory is a model for the behavior of an ideal gas. However, it is useful for predicting the behaviors of gases and liquids and solids that we'll see later. So we're going to start by defining what we mean by an ideal gas. So an ideal gas is a gas that is composed of tiny particles. And so we say that gases are composed of particles that are so tiny that they are mostly made up of empty space. And that the collisions in an ideal gas are perfectly elastic. So what that means is elastic collisions means that no motion is lost in the collision of particles either with one another or with the container that they are in. And so this thing is called a Newton's cradle. And if it was operating um, in a true vacuum, for instance, it would continue forever because no uh, energy would be lost in the collisions. So again, for an ideal gas, mostly empty space, very tiny particles, collisions are perfectly elastic. No energy is lost when particles collide. The Gas particles are moving in constant, rapid, random motion. So that's an applet showing you allegedly random motion. There are no attractive forces or repulsive forces between the particles, so they're not attracted or repulsed by one another. Um, and the volume of the individual gas particles for an ideal gas is set as zero. So again, the reason that they're mostly empty space is the particles have a volume of zero. And the temperature of the gas depends on the average kinetic energy of the particles. So when you're measuring temperature, you're actually measuring the average, average kinetic energy of the particles. And when we talk about temperature for gases, we always have to use Kelvin temperature because the temperature where all motion ceases in our universe is absolute zero, which is zero degrees Kelvin. So again, this kinetic molecular theory is referring to an ideal gas. However, even though an ideal gas is this hy hypothetical gas that perfectly conforms to all of the assumptions of kinetic molecular theory, it applies very well to real gases. And again, the difference, the main difference between a real gas and an ideal gas is number one, the particles don't have a volume of zero. Number two, the particles do exert attractive and repulsive forces between one another, um, and their collisions are not elastic. There is energy lost. And real gases expand or fluid, have relatively low density, are compressible because their particles are far apart and they are capable of diffusing and effusing. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about kinetic theory as it relates to gases, then liquids, and then solids. And we'll talk very briefly about plasmas. So when we talk about gases, one of the first things we discuss is the pressure of a gas. And that's caused by the collisions in the container. And that container might be our atmosphere, or it might be a small bottle, for instance. So because the particles of a gas move randomly,
the pressure as a result is evenly distributed. And pressure is defined as force per unit area. So you have to ask yourself, how do you measure pressure? If you're measuring the pressure in your tire, for instance, you use a tire pressure gauge, gauge and it gives you the force per unit area. So if you're measuring your tire air pressure, it's in something called PSI, pounds per square inch, where pounds are a force and square inch is area. So how do we measure pressure? Typically we use a device that is called a barometer. And this is an example of a very crude barometer where you have a tube that is empty and you have a dish of liquid. Typically what we used was mercury. And what's happening is as air pressure is pushing down on the surface of this liquid mercury, it forces it up this tube. And so you can measure pressure as the height of this column of mercury. So again, the air pressure is pushing down and that forces the liquid up the tube. And so we can measure it in inches or millimeters of mercury. So the device we use is called a barometer. It was invented by this fellow, um, Evangelista Torricelli. He used a dish, like in the previous slide, where he had a dish of mercury and a column. And again, he noticed that as days changed, the height of the column of mercury changed. And again, a barometer is a device used to measure pressure, and it was developed by Evangelista Torricelli. So at standard atmospheric pressure at sea level, the height of the column of mercury is 760 millimeters of mercury. And so in honor of this fellow Torricelli, we refer to a millimeter of mercury as a tor. And so now we need to look at what we use for pressure units. So the units of pressure are shown by this particular um, graph. And so um, in the previous slide, I showed you that at sea level, um, a column of mercury uh, pressure would be 760 millimeters. Remember, we measure pressure in the height of the column of mercury. And 760 millimeters, also known as 760 tor, um, is one atmosphere. So that's standard atmospheric pressure. Remember when we talked about STP, standard pressure was one ATM. So the units that we use for pressure are atmospheres. So one atmosphere is the same as 760 millimeters, and that's the same as 760 tor. And then the SI unit for pressure is called a Pascal. And one atmosphere is the same as 101,325 Pascals. To make it easier, we use a kilopascal. So one atmosphere is 101.325 kilopascals, which is the same as 760 millimeters of mercury. I know that's a lot of stuff. So for pressure conversions, and I'm just going to show you what a worksheet would look like. Um, we know that one atmosphere is the same as 760 millimeters, which is the same as 760 tor, which is the same as 101.3 kilopascals. Now, this is dimensional analysis. So what we're going to be doing is a pressure conversion. And again, we're going to be using these as our conversion factors. So 1 ATM equals 760, or 1 ATM equals 101.325, or 101.3 is 760. So those would be our conversions. So when you're doing these calculations, you would always start with your given, in this case 1,500 millimeters, and then you would pick the conversion fact that would get you there. So in the case of how many atmospheres are equal to 1,500 millimeters, you're going to be using the conversion between ATM and millimeters. So start with the given, and then you would multiply by 1 ATM over 760 millimeters. So I'm going to do one of these for you. So how many atmospheres are 1,500 millimeters of mercury? So here I've set it up, 1,500 millimeters of mercury, that's our given. Our conversion fact is 1 ATM is 760 millimeters. And then you would go in and you would cancel. Notice the unit I want is atmospheres. 
the unit I was given is millimeters. It has to be in the denominator, so it cancels out. And then when I plug that into my calculator, I get this number. Looking up here, I see that I only had two significant digits. My second significant digit would be the 1.9, the, the 9 in that number. And since the number after it is a 7, I would have to round up. 5 and above, you give it a shove, and that would give me 2.0 ATMs. So that's how you do these pressure conversions. They're very straightforward. It's dimensional analysis. You're going to use the conversion fact, and you'll get your answer and round to the correct number of significant digits. So for today, this is Ms. Augustine signing off.